Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening, depend on where you are. Uh, thank you for your joining in the webinar on collaborative RDND research development and demonstration in sustainable mobility. Uh, I'm the moderator, as uh, I'm Suil Kang, coordination officer of CTCN. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce uh, today's program and uh, three speakers, and then we'll start uh, webinar. Okay, so uh, as you know, this uh, CTCN organize, have organized uh, five webinars uh, on five system transformation areas uh, from July. So this is the final and the people's webinar on uh, collaborative RDND in sustainable mobility. Uh, so I'll in, uh, recommend every speaker to turn put camera on during presentation. And then also for audience, I uh, recommend you turn uh, put your camera off. And then if you have any questions, you can use the hands up icon and then or you can use the chat box to uh, raise your question. OK, so today we have uh, three speakers. First speaker is Vashid Dar from UNEP Copenhagen Climate Center. He will uh, deliver us uh, mitigation options for sustainable mobility. So he'll uh, give us whole picture, global picture on mitigation options for sustainable mobility. He will give 15 minutes presentation and we'll have a five minutes Q&A session for his uh, speech. Second uh, speaker is Devon Palmer. Uh, he is from Korea National University of Transportation, briefly KNUT. So uh, he will deliver the CTCN technical assistance project uh, in Bangladesh on uh, transportation. Uh, after that, we'll have a uh, third speaker, Gabriela Pavaron. Uh, Director of EV Infrastructure 7 Gen. Uh, she's uh, from uh, Vancouver in Canada. It's very early morning, 5 a.m. there. Thank you so much, Gabriela. So she will deliver uh, medium and heavy duty plate electrification. So main challenges and opportunities. So and after that, we'll have a 10 minutes panel discussion. So I will prepare specific question for each speaker. And uh, and then we'll have a, we'll close uh, the webinar. Okay, so I'll stop the sharing the screen. OK, so I would like to give the floor to Subasi. The yeah, floor is yours. Thank you, Subasi. Thanks, uh, Sweet, uh, for, uh, for giving this opportunity. And thanks to CTC for giving the opportunity for introducing this topic. Uh, and uh, I'll just now share my slides and like to get a confirmation if you are able to see the slides now. Yes, we can see. OK, great. So uh, as Suil introduced, so I will talk a little bit about the different mitigation options for sustainable mobility. Uh, and uh, this particular presentation uh, largely uh, borrows from uh, the work we did within the sixth assessment of IPCCC, where I participated as a lead author. And the first uh, you can see slide you see here is about the historical uh, growth of transport-related emissions. 
between 1990 and 2019. As you can see here, transport sector emissions have grown and they have not only grown, they have grown at a faster pace than other sectors. And as a result, what uh, you find is that uh, the transport related emissions, which were around 13% in 1990, have increased to 15% in 2019. And they, when we when we try to look at the future now, because the IPCC sixth assessment is also looking at the future litigation pathways, what you find out is that transport is also relatively a harder to abate sectors. And as a result, even in the 1.5 degree scenario, which is in line with the Paris ambition, you find that uh, in transport sector there, uh, for the 1.5 degree scenario, the reduction will be between 35 to 50%. But uh, given uh, the kind of, uh, you can say, lock-ins we have in transport, it's a quite a transformative uh, or a big change from the business as usual, which is required to move to that. And we will uh, now look at uh, more in terms of what are the different, uh, you can say, strategies through which we can achieve. So the first, you can say, way of looking at transport-related uh, mitigation options is uh, in transport, we generally look at avoid, shift, and improve approach. But uh, in the sixth assessment, they have uh, a, a little bit different. So to, they also talk of three different strategies. So the first is to do with more changing the behavior, the social behavioral changes, which can bring some reductions. And I would like you to focus because this particular slide has on the right different sectors, if you focus on the land transport, which is more, more or less the theme of my presentation, so you can see that for the land transportation behavioral change, the reductions are shown in blue color. So it provides you the first wedge for reducing these emissions. Then you can uh, look at infrastructures. So infrastructure investments can also result in a substantial reduction in emissions. And finally, the technology. Now, what do we exactly mean by socio-cultural factors is factors which essentially can affect the demand for transportation itself, for example, through majors such as teleworking, telecommuting, and all that. Uh, it also actually includes here active mobility like cycling, walking, which can uh, basically change the demand from motorized to non-motorized modes of transport. The second option which they talk about is infrastructure, which is like investments in public transportation, which is quite obvious. But uh, currently we also see across the world there is a growth in the shared mobility. Uh, but also looking at the design of our cities, how we can build more compact cities or how we can through special planning improve the access to public transportation and all that. So all that is part of the infrastructure. And finally, we in some way have to rely on technology because there is so much dependence in the transport sector on fossil fuels. So that it is very obvious that without technology, we cannot solve this problem. And I think a lot of what we will talk is on this technology side in this uh, particular webinar. Now, uh, in terms of technologies, when we look at technologies a little bit in detail, as far as the transport sector is concerned, uh, in this slide, there is a mapping of the technology landscape for the transport sector. Uh, on the left, what you see is what are the fuels which go into the transport sectors. And these are the fuels which are also resulting in uh, a lot of these fossil, uh, you can say, emissions. Uh, but uh, here in this slide, what we are putting is the alternative fuels which can be uh, used uh, for decarbonization of the transportation sector. And on the right hand side, what we have is the different transportation segments in which uh, 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 so where from the demand for transportation is coming. So you can say there is land transport, then there is aviation, and there is shipping and all that. And in between what you have is the different energy carriers, uh, such as electricity, hydrogen, biofuels, and vehicle technologies next to it. So vehicle technologies could be like battery electric vehicles, fuel cells, and advanced combustion engine technologies. But let's focus a little bit on the land transportation uh, side. Uh, and here I would suggest that you pay attention to the arrows. And the arrows have a meaning here because 
the arrows which are shown in the bold or in the full lines are those pathways which have a much more uh, you can say matured or more commercially viable now whereas when you look at this dashed pathways these are a little bit more into the pre commercialization stage or demonstration stages but not so much uh, you can say commercially viable as of now now as far as land transport is concerned you can see that the battery electric vehicles will play a very important part in this uh, both for light duty vehicles and as well as for heavy duty vehicles but when we are talking of heavy duty vehicles even uh, we could also be talking of uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles which could be coming into this space there they make some uh, you can say uh, case for the future i will leave out aviation and shipping because we are not so much discussing technologies or technology landscape in this webinar on that but this is just to give you an understanding of what could be the different options within the technology space also which can help us in uh, mitigating these emissions now we saw in the last presentation that battery electric vehicles is a very uh, is shown as a very uh, commercially viable or a uh, mature pathway for uh, decarbonization of the transport sector but this slide i'm presenting just to tell you that this story may be a little bit different when you look at the oecd countries and when we look at the developing countries and this particular trend is for electric vehicles the light duty electric vehicles uh, to be very precise and you can see here that uh, here on the left hand side you have countries which have actually now more than 10% market share in the new vehicle sales and uh, all the countries here are uh, oecd countries no developing countries in this in this list but if you look at the countries on the right the graph on the right it is drawn for countries from asia and here you can see electric vehicles is making some inroads uh, within the light duty vehicle space especially in china but a lot of countries are you can see a little bit struggling with getting it going and started so uh, most of these countries besides uh, china below you can say still below 2% market share and this is taken from the iea global ev outlook uh, they come up with an annual publication uh, so let's keep that in mind that there are certain challenges even when we talk of technologies like battery electric vehicles which are considered to be more mature and commercially viable now uh, you also saw that uh, in the in the graph which i was telling you about the technology light landscape that uh, as far as for example heavy duty vehicles are considered uh, here we could even have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles could be making uh, some kind of uh, playing some role in future but at the same time we have to keep in mind that when we talk of uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles they have this uh, uh, efficiency disadvantage or thermodynamic efficiency disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the battery electric vehicles and in this graph actually you are trying to see electric vehicles in comparison to the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in comparison to vehicles which can use a synthetic diesel or synthetic petrol which can again be produced from the hydrogen but as you can see at the bottom the overall efficiency of different pathways is indicated so battery electric vehicles you can see is around 77% overall efficiency from electricity production to the use uh, uh, to the final use uh, within the vehicle whereas when we look at the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle the efficiency is only 33% so this creates you can say a kind of a inherent barrier and uh, and therefore uh, even and, and in this graphic they are trying to also show what could be the uh, efficiencies in let's say 2050 so even in 2050 this efficiency difference won't be uh, it might be reduced like in case of battery electric vehicles it will be reduced to 81 percent but there will be a bigger jump in case of uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles so it will increase to 42 percent so this gap will reduce but there will be still a big gap between these two technologies uh, now we, we didn't talk a little bit so uh, uh, so biofuels uh, as you know has also been uh, considered one of the options uh, for uh, uh, decarbonization pathways and when we talk of biofuels generally we can see that there are a number of uh, technologies biofuel technologies of fuels like ethanol biodiesel biomethane which have 
which are already commercial and they, this uh, particular graph is showing you to the uh, technology readiness levels of different biofuel technologies and you can see that some of the technologies are commercially viable but the problem here has been largely and largely why we are not discussing so much about biofuels is because a lot of these technologies which are commercially viable they have these challenges with respect to food uh, security for example when we are talking of ethanol and biodiesel so these debates become very intense and as a result there is not been actively pursued in many cases uh, and but there are certain technologies like for example the first technology in this list lignocellulosic ethanol which is in you can say some kind of a pre-commercialization stages uh, and it could play some role in future and it could, uh, you can say, take biofuels out of this bind of uh, food uh, versus uh, on land uh, uh, available for biofuel plantations and all that. So, so, so th this is just to give you an overview. Now, in terms of, because we are here talking of mitigation options, so it is also important to see which of these options are actually very uh, attractive in terms of the mitigation from the mitigation side. And, uh, and generally, when we talk of mitigation, we are sometimes looking at emissions which are happening at the point of use. But uh, many of these technologies have emissions in production and all that. So in that context, we try to look at the overall life cycle emissions of these different technologies. And I would uh, say that let's first look at in this graph, those technologies which have very low, which are those technologies which can give us uh, very large reductions in GHG emissions. And these are, for example, fuel cell vehicles running on hydrogen. But again, the condition is that this hydrogen should be produced with low carbon electricity, which is coming from the renewables or green hydrogen. Similarly, battery electric vehicles can also be a very uh, attractive option from the mitigation standpoint. But again, the electricity should be coming from the renewable side. Then it is very attractive. Uh, similarly, uh, in case of uh, biofuels, it is the advanced biofuels uh, which make uh, the cut. But uh, this is in terms of the different technologies which can be very important or significant in terms of only when we are not, we are not looking at the commercial viability, but more mostly here from the perspective of the GHG mitigation overall life cycle GHG emissions. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, in terms, because we we uh, we also ma made this remark that battery electric vehicles are quite uh, a significant uh, contributor and a major technology for de decarbonization of the transport sector. But we need to keep in mind that electrification should also be accompanied by decarbonization of the electricity. Because if this electricity is coming from natural gas or coal, and you can see it in this uh, in the bars, then it becomes worse in case of mitigation. In fact, if you are using coal-based electricity for battery electric vehicles, then it can be even worse than your uh, current, uh, uh, you can say, internal combustion engine technologies which are running on fossil fuels. So this we need to keep in mind. So uh, electrification of transport and decarbonization of electricity, they should go hand in hand. So they, uh, that, that is another uh, point I wanted to make. Uh, now we will uh, have, uh, uh, I think, uh, two more presentations which will, I think, go deeper into the issues of, uh, in terms of what what can be done or what is being done for actually taking up these technologies within the countries. But here I just wanted to touch upon uh, what is really impeding, for example, electrification within the developing countries, uh, and. Uh, you can find that there are a number of reasons for that, and I have listed some of the more important reasons which come uh, uh, from the literature. Uh, the first two are to do more to deal with the financing. So here, uh, as far as developing countries are considered, they have a much higher cost of capital. So doing uh, like more capital intensive projects in these countries becomes a, a barrier for these technologies. The second is the the risk appetite of the financial institutions in these countries. So that also creates problems for uh, private sector players to uh, access funding for projects uh, in this direction. Uh, many countries, for example, we uh, actually from with CTC and assistance, we did uh, three actually EV roadmaps 
uh, in Ghana, in Zimbabwe and the Solomon Islands. And it came out very clearly that they don't have much manufacturing capacities or any value chains, for example, for EVs. So as a result, a lot of the technology is coming from outside. So it creates two kinds of challenges. One is that the technologies may not be exactly designed for purpose for the countries and also because it increases their costs at the same time. Uh, the, then there is also this issue what we and, we, and that's what uh, the CTC and DA was in these countries was about providing support to develop electric uh, uh, EV policy frameworks in these countries because they are supporting regulations are not, not there and the policy, you can say environment is not very conducive for electric vehicles. So that is one point. Uh, then uh, uh, finally, there were there are also these issues with respect to. Yeah. So there are the issues with respect to technical uh, capacities within the countries and affordability. And in Thailand, we could see that they have now achieved more than one percent market share for AVs in light duty vehicles. And we are trying to look at what they have been doing. Uh, uh, and you could see that Thailand has tried to use its uh, uh, capabilities in manufacturing of automobiles and leverage and position itself as a hub for EV manufacturing. So to create a manufacturing base within Thailand, it has lowered tariffs on imports of components and uh, also given incentives to manufacture. So all these first three things they have done is directly to support the manufacturing of EVs in these countries. Then to boost the demand is also to provide special electricity tariffs, subsidy on charging equipments. So this so that because charging is a very important point, though a lot of the EVs are charged at home or but at the same time, the role of public charging is very important. So if the government is providing some incentive for that, that's very important. And to give a more policy certainty, they have also set this overall ambition to have only zero emission vehicles by 2035. It is also giving a lot of, you can say, signal to the man, uh, private sector that this is a country where we should be investing on. So it's a little bit uh, to uh, give a glimpse of what is happening at the ground level. And finally, I'll leave you with the final conclusions. Uh, I'll repeat what I said earlier, is that there are multiple options to decarbonize transport, and they start from demand side majors and supply side majors, and technology definitely plays an important role. And electric vehicles as a technology uh, comes out as a technology, especially for the light duty vehicles, which will provide the highest reductions in the emissions. But at the same time, when we are working with developing countries, we need to keep in mind that they face these challenges on financing side, on the policy side, uh, in terms of local manufacturing capacities, affordability, and, and so on and so forth. Thank you for patience, and I would be yeah. happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, Subhashi, for the comprehensive and insightful presentation you provided even many uh, technology aspect, also the uh, other uh, challenges uh, additionally. Thank you so much. So the floor is open, so if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hands up and then Actually, uh, uh, okay, so we, uh, okay, uh, Subasi, can you see the yeah. Arbor, Arbor Zell's, uh question in the chat box? I'm just, I'm just, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so this is what I was saying. Should it be urgently and medically all the negative external these new technologies, spaces, the hazardous and explosive emissions, and also conduct a comparison of all the natural resources involved. Uh, I uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's a very valid question. I think around the critical materials and uh, for, for example, for batteries, this is, in fact, in UNEP, uh, uh, we have a very big program on global EV, uh, 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 EV uh, which is, uh, you can say, coordinated by our colleagues at the Nairobi. And I understand that they would be having 
a project which is looking into these aspects as well. But you are very right. I think you should be looking at a very integrated manner. So there are negative externalities associated in, in the extraction. So some aspect is to have this very concept of circular economy so that you can, for example, batteries. So batteries have, have a lot of materials which can be a waste, but they can also be recycled uh, into uh, and reused. And the other thing is like you can also repurpose the batteries. So, so repurposing the batteries can be a solution for that. But at the same time, what I would like to say here that if you look at the overall growth in the electric vehicles, the number of batteries which will be coming will be quite phenomenal. So, so there has to be like, uh, uh, it's a topic in itself, so how it has to be managed. But uh, this whole issue is, is being given, you can say, some kind of an importance and uh, primacy within a different context, but not so much within the transport space, but more within the circular economy space and all that. OK, thank you. Uh, considering the time uh, constraint, we'll just get one more question from Haitan. Could you uh, put your camera on and then make uh, uh, raise the question to Subash? Uh, I think I can read the, the question like there is one question which is talking mm -hmm. about does the graph on the fifth slide refer to all LDVs including no the uh, uh, LDVs is not including here two and three wheelers uh, it's not including two and three wheelers and then there is one more question uh, three hours origination issue LC yeah I think that question I have in some sense tried to answer uh, earlier also uh, any other question? OK, then I think that uh, during uh, other uh, presentation, if you have yeah. any question, you can put it in the chat box. OK, so now we'll move on to the second uh, speaker, Devon. Uh, so he will uh, deliver his uh, work uh, in Bangladesh uh, transportation sector uh, through the CTCNTA. Uh, thank you, Devon. Uh, the floor is yours. OK. Oh, Subhashi, could you? Uh, oh, yeah. Stop. Can you see that OK? Yes. OK, great. <clears throat> So hello, my name is Devin Farmer. Um, I'm a senior researcher with the uh, Korea National U uh, University of Transportation. Uh, I'm based in Korea. I'm actually uh, Canadian from uh, Vancouver as well as our uh, next speaker as well, I think. So very nice to meet you. And uh, today I'm gonna be talking about um, some lessons we've learned as being a project implementer for two CTC and TAs in 2022 and 2023. Uh, in Laos and uh, in Bangladesh. So I'm going to introduce you to the work we did for those two countries, talk about some of the challenges we had uh, to get the work done, and some concluding uh, remarks at the end. So uh, yeah, let's get right into it. So the first one we did uh, was for the Lao PDR. So this was a public transport planning uh, technical assistance, uh, where we had a, a few tasks that we did for them. Um, including a review of a related transportation master plan that they had ongoing and uh, developing some smart transport plans for the capital city in, in, in Laos, which is Vientiane, and doing a pre-feasibility study for demand responsive transit. So this is all planning for the public transport system, smart public transport. Uh, we also had a capacity building uh, function in there as well. So for the, the, the smart transport part, we, we basically looked at a lot of different uh, technologies out there for ITS and smart transport based on what's available in Korea or where we are. And we looked at um, a, a big evaluation of all these different options for, for VNTN, what would work there. So it was all customized to see based on their needs in that city, um, sort of what features would you know, work for them. 
and we came up with basically a plan for them uh, in, in the future to kind of implement these technologies in their public transport system, mostly focused on the bus system um, in terms of when and which, which, uh, which technologies would work for best for them. So one of the most exciting ones was for their uh, bus, uh, main bus stop, which is uh, the busiest bus stop in the city. So there's a number of upgrades they could do to it to kind of make it smarter and um, make it more useful and convenient for, for public transport passengers in that city. Um, the other part of this was to look at uh, demand responsive transit. So uh, if you don't know, this is basically uh, you know, a type of transportation which will um, respond to uh, real-time demand. So you, you have a smartphone or something like that, you can call it up similar to Uber, but it's a shared, shared bus. And what was interesting about this one is we looked at um, applying this kind of technology to uh, the informal transport network. So in, in Laos, they and in Thailand too, they have a lot of informal transport, which is called Song Tao, which is basically a truck with some seats in the back. Um, and on a separate plan done by JICA, the Japanese um, ODA agency, they, they, they found there's some inefficiencies in these, uh, these networks because these you know, these Song Tao are basically competing with the, the bigger conventional buses and it's not running very efficiently. So what they had looked at in their plan was um, integrating those into the sort of official public transport system. And maybe in the future, looking at changing them to demand responsive transport, making them a little smarter. So uh, that's basically where we, we took that. And um, we did a sort of a pre-feasibility study for that. Uh, in the city, you know, converting these kind of trucks, which have people in the back as, uh, you know, as a DRT. So um, we found some solutions that would work for them and still be uh, financially uh, sustainable. So this was you know, a good result for that. And we did a capacity building uh, segment as well. So we invited some some people from uh, the government there uh, to, to Korea and they got to experience these technologies uh, you know in, in real life so we took uh, we we took we had some uh, lessons basically in the classroom and then we got to actually go use one of these uh, DRT uh, buses out in Incheon in Korea and uh, we also looked at some of the EV infrastructure for buses that they had there and just got familiar with all the different ITS that uh, we could potentially put in Vientiane in the future so this was really good uh, opportunity for them to learn about it and you know see this stuff with their own eyes. Um, so this was a, a great project and we we had a lot of success with it. Um, and you know the good news is we also have kind of a next step. So the funding for uh, this project you know is is going to be over pretty soon. And um, the, always the next step is you know what we're trying to think about. So we have an opportunity to work with them potentially in the future as well to continue these studies and potentially get some funding for implementation with another program with the Korean government. Uh, so we've applied uh, for that with them. So uh, we should hear pretty soon if we if we get that new funding for the, for the next step in this TA. Okay, and so the other one we've been working on over the last year or so is uh, for Dhaka, Bangladesh, capital city of Bangladesh. And we what we did for them was another transport, uh, public transport system planning project. So we uh, developed a framework for a real-time information system, uh, which is basically a system that'll track buses in real time. So we designed, um, you know, uh, we, we made a list of the, the technical specifications and, you know, all the kind of things they would need to know if they wanted to actually implement one of these things in the future, as well as what it would cost them. And we did a webinar about uh, bus reform, uh, which we worked with the World Bank on that one, and a few other things as well. So real-time information, uh, let me turn that sound off, is uh, you know is is becoming a lot a, a standard thing you see in a lot of developing country or developed countries to um, you know give inform give more information to passengers of buses uh, who can help you know plan their journeys more and just makes them a lot more convenient. So. Not just in Dhaka, but in many cities around the world, buses are getting delayed. Um, they're not on time. So the more information you can provide to customers, um, that just increases the convenience, and that has been shown 
to make the whole mode more attractive. We're not even making the buses faster necessarily, but we are giving that information to passengers. It makes it more convenient. And these technologies have a lot of benefits as well for operators. So they can, um, you know, they can actually increase the efficiency of operations overall. So there's like a few different components, uh, you know, equipment that gets installed on the buses themselves and a management center, which would be a bunch of servers and other equipment. So that's on the operator side. And on the customer side, once you have this technology installed, um, there's you know other options too. You can install uh, digital sign boards at the bus stops, which tell you, you know, in real time when the buses are arriving, and as well as you know the web side of things as well. So this is an example of uh, once you have everything set up, you can have this kind of information for for customers, uh, bus customers at their bus stops. We also came up with some implementation scenarios. So looking at how they would go about um, implementing the system in DACA, uh, came up with some mockups for the web access and a few corridors uh, that we believe would be the best place to start sort of um, geographically. So this one is almost wrapped up as well. And we're looking at the next steps as well for this funding. How would they go you know, take this to the, to the next step? Uh, they've got a few options. And they could also self-fund it. Okay, so for this next section, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we faced while doing this as an implementer, and um, you know how we how we solve them. And hopefully, this is useful for anyone who is working on this kind of project, a developed country helping out a developing country, and sort of you know some of the challenges we faced and what what we did to kind of move on and get the project done. Um, so the first challenge we, we had, which was on uh, one of our projects for CTCN, was uh, we discovered early on that the scope of work that we were doing for this project was very similar to what another agency was doing uh, at the same time in the same city. So um, this was a little confusing for us at first, but we knew we had to we now had to change it. So we couldn't change it completely. This is you know still going to be focusing on public transportation. Uh, planning, which is what you know what we do, um, but we wouldn't didn't want to just do the same thing as this other agency was doing. So, you know, our solution went to this was well, we just had to go to to the country and we had you know had a few meetings. We pitched some some different ideas um, and we basically found a niche. And in this case, it was with technology. So, um, you know, we are very familiar with all the ITS and DRT in Korea, and we when we pitched that to them. Uh, they, you know, they were very receptive to that idea, and so we kind of moved on from there. So we're still focused on public transport, which was what the original request was, but uh, we did manage to, you know, slightly change uh, the scope to kind of better match their needs. Um, so it just took us going out there, basically, and having some meetings. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth later on uh, with all the various stakeholders, but um, we managed to make you know everybody relatively happy in the end, um, so that's you know that's what it took in this case, it was just quite a bit of back and forth. Um, another another issue we had was um, in another project. The uh, the request was made to us to uh, to do this work, and it had a clear scope of work. So what we did is we just sort of got ready and and went for it. And what we found was. The other side, you know, wasn't quite ready to kind of be, to kind of continue with it. So the the, the agency that had made uh, the request didn't actually have the capacity to to kind of manage us day to day and you know deal with our requests and things like this. So we needed you know another agency over there to kind of help us in the day to day uh, workings of this project. So once again, it took us uh, traveling over there, you know, having face to face meetings. Once we did that, the ball got rolling, and we kind of we figured this out with some back and forth, um, and a little bit of negotiation. We met with the agency, and um, they were yeah super helpful in getting getting us set up. Um, over time, though, uh, they did get a little busy and you know weren't quite uh, as involved. But uh, initially, at least, it was um, you know it was very useful for them uh, to help us out on this project. Okay, and probably this is another common issue, especially working in developing countries, is, is getting good data. So, uh, you know, 
especially in, in these two countries we're working in Lao PDR and in, in Bangladesh, it's, it's really hard to find you know, good data about transport networks specifically. So uh, solution for us, you know, you got to get creative. Uh, a lot of open data available online, especially for mapping data. Some online databases, usually they're not very good. They don't, you know, if it's free, you know, usually the data is not that useful, but for mapping data, that is definitely available. And, um, you know, one of the best things we did was to, to make partnerships. Um, so for in the case of uh, Vientiane, we befriended uh, JICA, who was the Japanese, who were doing some very similar work in the same city. And they agreed to share some data with us and we agreed to share some data with them. So uh, we found they were you know, very receptive. We just sent an email and said, hey, you know, we're working on this project. How can we, how can we work together? And um, yeah, people are, I find if you just reach out, people are very you know, happy to get work together and kind of you know, if, for a common goal. Um, as well as, you know, just being creative and if you do, if the data doesn't exist, you, you're going to need to do your own survey and hire some local people to make the data. But we're very spoiled uh, where we are, you know, we have lots of data available, but uh, in developing countries, that's definitely not the case. Okay, um, and last challenge is with our, you know, complex arrangements uh, for um, uh, funding and, and managing. So uh, in, this is the case we had with the Lao project. So this was a pro bono, you say. So we have a funding agency, which is uh, from Korea, and uh, the managing agency, which is CTCN. And then we have, of course, a client in the, in the uh, developing country. So we have, you know, four bosses, basically. Um, so this was, you know, pretty, pretty challenging to, to work with. And what we had was basically a lot of extra reporting we had to do and some few requirements um, that were basically tacked on by all the various bosses that we had. So, um, you know, this, uh, you know, our, in order to get through this, there's not a lot you can do. So in our case, we just had to, you know, spend extra time um, doing, filling out these reporting requirements, um, which takes a lot longer um, and trying to keep everybody in the loop which is difficult because, you know, over these different countries, even there's, you know, different languages and it's, 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 it's definitely difficult to keep everybody on the same page. Um, but it's something that we, you need to do in this sort of situation. Um, overall, so we had a little bit less time to spend on our TA and more time reporting what we've been doing. Uh, but I believe there's, you know, benefits to these kinds of arrangements. Uh, first of all, in the CTN's, CTCN's case, you know, the foreign government is paying for the bill, so they get a little bit of money that way. And um, this is, you know, how we were actually selected. So the, um, on the Korea side, they have, you know, a little bit more knowledge locally so they can find, you know, uh, an, an implementer like us who's you know, ready to go and, and actually able to do this. So there is some benefits to these arrangements, but uh, the implementer needs to know it's gonna you know, be a little bit more complicated for them. Okay, so, um, some overall, you know, lessons the, that I've learned, you know, that we've learned uh, over the last year or two doing this um, is, um, you know, a lot of these issues were basically just communication. Um, we didn't really have a lot of technical issues that weren't solvable. Um, but uh, we did have better communication with sort of one project versus the other. I think the reason for that was because uh, the agency we were working with uh, benefited more directly from uh, the work that we were doing. Um, and in, in that case, we actually invited them to Korea and, you know, they, uh, you know, they saw the technology in person and there was another incentive to kind of, uh, work together, uh, there and, you know, basically by meeting them more often, we, we had a better working relationship, uh, not that we don't in the other project, but it was just a little better in one than the other. Um, so I do think it's really worth it if there is, you know, budget and opportunity to invite people from the developing country to the country, the developed country, or you know, wherever this technology already is so they can experience it and see it firsthand. Uh, that's super helpful and um, you know, a, a really good thing to do if you have the budget for it. And you know, we also found sometimes email is just not getting us very far. So we just needed to fly out there and have some have some face-to-face -face discussions. And once we did that, you know, things start moving quicker. 
Um, and in a lot of these countries too, we have lots of lots of different projects going on. JICA, you know, GIZ also uh, working on all kinds of different things. So, um, you know, it's always good to kind of reach out. We found um, the people even in the other projects are you know happy to work together. So just need to kind of get that communication going and you know work together. And I think it's you know that's the right thing to do is just keep keep communicating with other uh, other agencies as well. Okay, and in terms of um, technology transfer too, what we've found is there is a, a lot of opportunity for technology adoption, especially in public transport, which is you know what we look in, uh, what we're uh, involved in, especially in uh, the bus networks, which we find are not getting as much attention. So a lot of funding and new projects in you know rail and BRT and sort of fancy uh, you know more interesting projects, but you know, the bus networks, which are still used by, you know, many, many people, um, they have, you know, there's ample opportunity here to improve the quality of the bus network using technology, and that is going to have a big impact. Um, and at the same time, you know, technology, uh, which we've looked at in, in our two projects is, you know, really interesting and exciting, but some basics are, you know, necessary to just more buses, more service, is sometimes all that they need. Um, you know, as much technology as you can pack on the bus, if it's only running every two hours, then you know people aren't going to use it. So at the end of the day, it's about service uh, first and foremost. And there's a lot of opportunity to work with informal transport, you know, which is extremely common in Southeast Asia. South Asia, basically, these are you know, you know trucks and tuk-tuks and these kinds of things. Uh, there's a big opportunity to really think how these fit in with the greater public transport system and how we can integrate you know, technology and make them smarter and more convenient, as well as opportunity for a road focus, a road safety focus too. Uh, lots of opportunity there to learn uh, from developed countries who have successfully reduced traffic accidents, uh, not carbon reduction per se, but still uh, incredibly important. Okay. That's it from me, and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Devon. Really, uh, you provided us very valuable uh, like challenges, and then how you solve those issues, and then also you showed us the potential of uh, the areas in many other countries. Thank you so much. And then also, I think that the CTCN really recognized that for the pro bono PA supported by Korean government, I think CTCN should really actively involved in communication for that. So I think that is really important message to us. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, I think I saw there is a uh, one question regarding the life cycle emission of shared mobility services at, in the chat box. Subasi or Gabriela or Devon, can you uh, give answer for that? Is it common to integrate energy consumption from data gathering, processing, and management? Hmm. I think probably not. <laughs> would be, I, I don't really know, I guess. But um, okay. my guess would be no. That's a good, you know, good point. Um, okay, right. so I, I can walk through a little bit uh, and my oh, yeah, presentation sure. about this as well. So I think like okay. it depends. Like that's my answer. <laughs> so I'll walk through okay. that. Okay, let's see. Uh, we wait for. Uh, Gabriela's presentation. I think she she can mention uh, the answer in the during the presentation. Uh, are there any further questions? Okay. Uh, actually, the one I I would like to give one question to Devon that actually you mentioned about the uh, uh, I mean uh, additional funding or scale of fundings. So I really wonder that, like, uh, what could be the 
uh, role of I mean, the Bangladesh and Lao PDL government in those getting uh, scale of funding. So actually, you are trying to get uh, find the fundings, but my point is that uh, you think that how much important the role of uh, Bangladesh and Lao PDL Lao government for the scaling up or getting funding. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in the end, it's on them, right? We're, you know, we're around just for a temporary amount of time. We're, you know, we're giving some advice and then our project is over. And, you know, we're personally, we're doing as much as we can to help with those next steps. Uh, because I think it's the hardest part. Doing the planning is, you know, pretty easy in the end. Uh, we can say a lot of different things, but it's just getting the funding and, you know, uh, which is the which is the tough part. So I think it's incredibly important that, um, the developing country kind of take that really seriously. There's so much opportunity, though, I think, um, you know, especially in, in our cases, you know, specifically the government of Korea is very interested in um, in funding technology projects that are utilizing Korean technology overseas. They're super interested in that. So there's incredible opportunity for them to leverage uh, both these countries, LDCs, too, at the moment. So they have, you know, more opportunity to get um, ODA. Eventually, though, that should be um, done by the country themselves. And in the case of Bangladesh, I think they definitely can. Uh, their economy is growing big time, and uh, I think they have the capability. And I think on the Lao side, uh, might take a little bit more time, especially with their public transport system. It's a little weak at the moment, so they they will need some assistance, I think, for the uh, the short term, definitely. Okay, thank you. Actually, we have one. If you, you see the chat box, there is a Arbor girl. She, yeah, may questioning the air quality in the concept of in intermodal public transportation. Can you, someone, can you answer for that? Yeah, I think that's quite commonly done in um, in socioeconomic cost benefit analysis. You can definitely include air quality um, as one of the you know benefits of reducing um, you know diesel fumes or or whatever it is in that case. Um, we didn't in this case because we weren't um, we didn't really talk about the buses themselves as the technology, but. Um, yes, I think that's quite commonly done, actually. Okay, thank you. We can take a last question from Ulysses. Uh, you know, what are your recommendations on how to obtain better reproducibility of the public policy intervention for integrate mobility green technologies in the development program? Can you... Better reproducibility. Hmm. I think um, you mean actually implemented, <laughs> I think, right? I think that's what they mean. Um, better. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Reproducible improvement. Right. Well, the, the the recommendations have to be um, basically uh, reasonable and attainable. So I've seen some plans for the countries we've been working in, which didn't even come close to coming true. They were, you know, wildly optimistic, basically. Um, and I mean, it's good to be optimistic, but um, you know, at the end of the day, if we're talking about a project with a huge cost then i think it just gets pushed to the side and you know isn't taken seriously so uh i think that's why you know our project we looked at using the informal the, the informal public transport system which basically already exists and just kind of upgrading it a little bit uh which is you know a, a nice kind of low-hanging fruit that they could definitely do um fairly easily within a reasonable budget so maybe that would be my recommendation reasonable recommendations that um, 
are pretty realistic and you can look at what was done before and if it didn't happen then just don't do that again uh basically think about you know that was unrealistic so that gives you kind of a, a place to start with i think that's what i would answer that Okay, thank you, Devon, for your uh, wonderful presentation and also very nice uh, answers for those questions. Thank you okay. again. And then uh, let's move on to the uh, third speaker, uh, Gabriela uh, from Vancouver. Uh, okay, the floor is yours, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share my screen in a second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Suyo. Uh, yeah, very happy to see also a counterpart from uh, Vancouver. Uh, I'm not originally from Vancouver, I'm from Brazil originally, but uh, yeah, I've been living in Canada for quite some time. Um, yeah, so just a quick presentation here on the uh, uh, medium heavy duty fleet electrification. Uh, I will be touching uh, in a few of the items that my other colleagues already touched uh, on fleet electrification, but mostly on the medium and heavy duty side. And you'll be surprised that uh, there are lots of synergies uh, from the challenges and recommendations, essentially, that uh, we are encountering this space in Canada and the US as we're uh, advancing fleet electrification for this, um, uh, this, uh, this space. Uh, I work for 7Gen. Uh, it's a basically a startup based in Canada. Um, yeah, and I'm basically, I'm the director of infrastructure uh, at 7Gen. Well, and I'll just explain a little bit like uh, the, the next steps here. So what I will cover in the agenda today uh, is essentially like just a quick introduction of what 7Gen does uh, uh, in a more boots on the ground approach uh, rather than just like looking at uh, you know, the, the, the surface uh, piece here. I'll introduce a little bit of the concept. I didn't come up with this concept, but essentially it's a, it's a visual way to represent the challenges we see ahead, which is basically related to the vehicle the charging infrastructure, the software, and the operations. All of these encompass what we are actually uh, trying to achieve when we're talking about fleet electrification. So I'll be discussing um, what are the challenges and also like uh, what are our experiences, essentially deploying these, um, uh, these key, key items, and then just a conclusion and a wrap up at the end. So just to walk through a little bit of what 7Gen does uh, in Canada. So we are a startup and our mission is essentially uh, decarbonized fleet electrification uh, across uh, Canada in the US essentially uh, through providing leasing solutions. So I, I heard one of the uh, speakers talking about like that uh, uh, financing uh, is basically one of the, the biggest constraints uh, and basically access to uh, access of capital because of the due, due to the high cost of capital, it's really complicated in some developing countries. Um, like that uh, may be true for the, for developing for for already developed countries uh, to have access to the capital, but uh, for the commercial space, you'd be really surprised that it's really like that we haven't get to the parity yet, like for the costs. So we believe that is basically the transportation sector is one of the biggest one in terms of emissions. Uh, we start to need to electrify right now, and it's one of that's going to like in terms of uh, uh, speed of, uh, of electrification is one of that's taking uh, longer to do. So we need to do something about it. Uh, so we're basically at 7Gen, we're basically doing and providing this uh, support uh, for, for fleets that want to electrify. Um, and we are basically what we do uh, in the day to day life is essentially uh, we buy the vehicle, we buy the charging infrastructure. Uh, we basically lease that back as a, in a, as a service model for our customers. Uh, basically, we take all the risk of implementation that they perceive uh, upfront uh, so that they can basically prepare and plan ahead uh, of the game, essentially. So what we do is basically site assessments very much similar to what uh, the, Devon was mentioning uh, in terms of implementation plan. Like we basically sit down with the customer we understand their needs, uh, their duty cycles, like what are, what are the routes, um, uh, what are their expectations today and in the future. Uh, we also plan ahead of uh, the game for them. So we just uh, go and understand the, you know, what would be their charging electrification plans. And we develop like a full finance package for them in that sense. And just, uh, uh, I'll just quickly walk through a little bit on the VISO um, uh, concept here. 
So I think like uh, when we started in this journey in Canada for fleet electrification, we face uh, uh, a lot of uh, challenges, but also we had really good positive experiences as we're really having the deployment experience um, in Canada, essentially. So I just would like to touch base a little bit like on the uh, the vehicle piece. When we're talking about the vehicle here, we're talking about a little bit like a, a multiple segments essentially. So we're talking about school buses sector. We're talking about uh, class seven, eight long haul trucks that they do cr cross uh, Canada, across the US, um, like in highway uh, type of um, duty cycle uh, distances. Like we're talking about last mile events uh, that they do daily deliveries within the city. For each one of those um, uh, potential customers or um, like use cases, they're basically uh, connected in this. In this, uh, like there is not a, a standard pathway forward, uh, straightforward pathway forward for for most of these um, um, like the the, the 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 vehicles here. But like what we see in commonality when we're basically discussing fleet electrification plans for them is essentially the speed of market and government adoption. We see it still uh, very slowly catching up in the speed of the market adoption and the government grants on that. However, we still see already like from Canada, like there is a VIP incentives uh, for charging infrastructure and developing uh, the network of chargers. Uh, and the NAVI program also in, uh, in uh, the US, like really pushing hard like for um, uh, attaining to the 2030 and 2035 goals uh, of having enough chargers and enough vehicles on the road. Uh, we see, as I mentioned, like the heavy upfront costs, uh, which is a big barrier, like for most of these uh, fleet managers and operators to start electrifying, especially the medium, uh, the small and medium operators. Uh, so one, one of the key aspects that uh, we see today is that partnerships are really key. So not only governments, but also like the private sector needs to start really looking at, uh, you know, basically developing funding funds uh, and opportunities to finance in this project. So in Canada, we have CAB Bank basically developing multiple, multiple pro projects um, with different organizations. Um, and um, yeah, and we have like uh, companies like mine essentially trying to discuss with uh, the private and senior debt partners to understand how we can capitalize and mobilize capital for those small and medium operators to start electrifying now. And uh, another aspect is related to behavior and driver uh, adoption. I think I saw one of the questions regarding uh, air quality and how is this considered um, in the cost analysis. One of the things is, um, you know, there is a huge resistance, uh, initial resistance when we are discussing with, um, with drivers um you know basically like a cultural mindset shift that needs to do like in terms of the logistics uh, world however after we start implementing that we see a very good positive response especially on the noise reduction and the air quality uh, um, uh, perception like from these uh, the drivers like you know they like some some of the use cases we we've, we've experienced most of these drivers they were basically uh, you know, basically performing like their duties with, you know, diesel, like smelling like diesel, smelling like gas, like at the end of the day. Uh, and now like with the electric vans, like they feel very proud and they feel that they are doing something like, you know, not only feel good for themselves, but they also feel that they're doing something good for the, uh, the country and the world as well. So that's very positive. And uh, in terms of uh, as considering that uh, in the uh, socioeconomic analysis, yes, that's considered, but that is still not considered in the uh, total cost of ownership analysis of multiple tools. So that is something that needs to be also addressed here. And lastly, I think like the technical, the lack of technical standards. Um, there are multiple vehicles being developed is a very new industry, uh, but basically like we need to have uh, basically more and more uh, partnerships of different multiple uh, OEMs coming together and really standardizing their connectors, like their uh, drive trains, power trains, like you know, essentially to allow us to uh, perform this at scale, essentially. Um, and uh, I think like just to, to go a little bit on the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure is one of the um, key aspects, I'd say. It's, as I say, it's basically the, 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 the chicken on the egg, essentially, like, right? Like, so sh should we start with the vehicle, but then we don't have the infrastructure? Should we start with the infrastructure, but then we don't have the vehicle to charge and utilize? So 
there is a big debate uh, on that. So one of the, the items I listed here is around the availability and reliability of charging stations. Um, like for us to start really electrifying uh, and giving confidence for most of the drivers, um, they see that the, like a, a, having access to a, an available, like existing charging station, but also reliable charging station that's going to be operational for the long, long term is very important. So uh, we are basically working with uh, basically multiple companies and other organizations to supply and, and supply chain also like to address and how we can quickly scale uh, uh, all these uh, hubs and, and highway corridors essentially that uh, uh, are doing this, this sort of work. Uh, we also see the same issues in terms of the vehicle, in terms of the uh, industry adoption of technical standards as well. So on the charging stations, we have some communication protocols and standards uh, like being developed or CPP and the uh, ISO uh, standards here. But we still a lot of the, we see still a lot of debate in the industry uh, regarding standardization. What sort of protocol we should actually uh, perceive here? Um, but like we see a really positive uh, uh, advancing um, in terms of, the, of in terms of this space as well. And lastly, one of the, the, the big challenges like we experience every day is basically uh, power constraints. Like every time we go to electrify a, a depot, a facility, like with uh, one of our uh, customers, like we face, uh, you know, how much power you actually have in the building. And then you have basically two options. Like one option is to use the power existing in the building and be limited to that uh, amount of power that's going to be really like for a small type of deployment. But long term, we need to think on how to onboard utilities uh, and the, basically the grid to come with dedicated EV um, uh, power um, for, for those times as well. So I think like that's, that's essentially one of the biggest debates like we have in Canada and in the US also how we can streamline this process to ensure that people can start electrifying um, uh, as soon as possible. And lastly, uh, on the software and operations, I think I heard a lot of uh, how hard data is to be retrieved uh, also in developing countries. Like, but uh, uh, you also also would be surprised like that uh, when we navigate through the um, logistics world, most of the data that we are basically retrieving today is is being doing is they are be, they are being done manually. So most of this uh, this this industry is not really digital digitalizing documentation like you know a lot of this has to be coming through interviews and going to the site and just really discussing with um, fleet managers and drivers so that is this is a huge roadblock i think like you know for us but like we are the same way that we're basically uh, discussing with um, uh, like the same way i heard uh, i think that one mentioning about this uh, we are um, working with in a way to digitalize and work with uh, uh, government institutions also like to bring uh, like and become more transparent uh, in terms of the, their their data uh, information that can support multiple organizations across uh, Canada in the US to start electrifying. Uh, on the software piece, uh, I think like one of the key aspects today that uh, we face is that when a person wants to start electrify, uh, they think of the vehicle, they're very excited about the vehicle. Uh, then they start thinking about the charging infrastructure. And then there is a bit of resistance, like should I, what should I actually do? Uh, you know, there is a, a bit of a, of a, like, what do I actually have to put in my, 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 my depot? Uh, but then when we talk about the software, it's really like another component, like another level of component. But uh, what we're experiencing is that once uh, uh, fleet managers are starting to understand the use of the software, they start ve very being on board. We are not used to having the same way like fuel pump stations in our homes, like but not right now developing a full charging stations at our depots. Uh, you know, basically we're strategizing having power, uh, like all allocated power in our uh, facilities uh, to start basically the electrifying. I think that is something that they can see as an optimization of their fleet operations. So uh, here I put like a lot around the load management. Load management uh, from the software perspective allows some of the chargers to derate to a certain level and dynamic uh, allocate powers like to dedicated times uh, so that they can avoid the utility uh, peak shaving costs, for example, like you know, so they can the demand chargers. Uh, and that they can basically optimize and use like the grid, the capacity uh, that they have uh, at a certain level at a certain uh, time, essentially. So that really supports them in the initial electrification journey. 
And lastly, uh, I think like cybersecurity, that's one of the growing also concerns from most uh, uh, fleet uh, managers as we're gathering this data, centralizing, monitoring all of this. Uh, but also like there is, there are lots of um, charger manufacturers and software uh, providers today that we work, that they are developing layers and layers of uh, uh, TLS and other uh, um, to really strengthen uh, the, the support network uh, for, for the software here and support like the operations and the, the fleet electrification from, from customers. Um, and lastly, just to conclude, I think uh, I would just recap. So the VISO concept, like it's basically like a, a more streamlined way to see that uh, when you're thinking about fleet electrification today, you're not only thinking about like the vehicle, you're talking about the vehicle infrastructure, software and operations. You need to all orchestrate that together to have a successful plan. And that's really imperative right now when we're trying to expedite and basically um, um, continue developing fleet electrification like across, uh, across uh, most, like the world. Uh, partnerships are very important. So I think like even as a business for us, uh, it's we would not be really uh, in, a, in a great space, let's say, if we're not partnering with multiple organizations from utilities, cities, government, uh, and really being able, like private sector, uh, other like NGOs as well. Like so essentially all of those organizations are very, very important like for us to actually uh, bring together a plan uh, because we have to think about creative ways sometimes. Like you know, we are basically developing a new industry in that sense. Uh, lastly, uh, I think like there are future opportunities, like very strong future opportunities for R&D. Like it's a new industry. We feel uh, it's a lot of things being developed and uh, there are lots of opportunities like job opportunities and also uh, uh, like really opportunities like to be, be developing and more entrepreneurial mindset, like to really be developing innovation products here. Every day, I just came back from a conference like in, in Edmonton. Every day we see, we see and feel um, different chargers, manufacturers with di solving different problems and softwares as well. Like, so if you have an idea, really like you know, uh, contact, like really go there and, and try to, to do something. And uh, yeah, and lastly, like essentially uh, advocate like for future and empowering uh, uh, changes today. Like the biggest uh, uh, message I, we have as a as a like a, from from myself and a, as a company as well. I think it's really it's really imperative for you to start electrifying now. Like uh, so you can be ahead of, of the curve. Uh, like we need to be um, achieving our 2030 2035 goals. Like in terms of you know carbon emissions reductions. Most of uh, companies already set up their targets, but they're very lagging. So what, el what else we can do to actually support on that? We're going to be in the space and trying to do uh, more and more. So that's just uh, my final message. But uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, so yeah, happy to receive any questions also. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gabriela. Uh, really like uh, you deliver our, us the successful uh, business case with the BISO approach that consider whole parts at the same time together. And then also uh, you mentioned uh, that the drivers really recognize uh, the importance and the impact of uh, using the EVs, it was very uh, amazing. So actually, there is a one. Can you see the chat box from? Uh, it is from the Florentino. Yeah, I see. In terms uh -huh. of urban freight, uh, mm -hmm. what are the customers you are working with? Are there are they in companies, industries that manage their own fleets to deliver their products, or transport logistic companies providing services to industries retailers? Uh, both. So we work with uh, uh, basically the drivers, like basically only operators um, uh, type of uh, customers. So essentially they own their, their own trucks uh, and they're basically delivering that for specific companies. And we also work with uh, transportation and logistic companies that they have their own uh, third party drivers or their own drivers like that do that they are basically thinking only like trying. So uh, as an example, like one of our biggest customers in, um, in Canada is um, we started off with uh, IKEA. Like IKEA is one of the um, that set like you know basically uh, goals like to basically become car, um, net zero uh, uh, logistics deliveries like by 2030. 
um, and they basically work with one of our customers, which is Gobolt, essentially, like that uh, um, they are basically providing a, a, a substantial amount of deliveries for them across Canada. So, and they basically started off as also a startup, like a, to uh, and, and grow as a business as well with uh, with us, like uh, because essentially they are providing uh, a different uh, outlook in the market and trying to adjust like on the logistics. Um, as for the school buses, um, one experience we're having right now, it's a very recent experience, but uh, for us, but uh, the Quebec government uh, has just issued like a mandate essentially that they need to start uh, uh, converting uh, the, you know, basically all the school buses, essentially they need to be full electric, like there will be not, there will be not uh, any diesel um, school buses sold in in, um, uh, in Quebec. So essentially that is driving a lot of uh, school operators and school buses companies to start electrifying. Like uh, So that's basically our, our experience right now, uh, dealing with uh, how we can facilitate this process like, to them. Okay, thank you, uh, Gabriela, for the uh, clear uh, explanation. Are there more questions? Uh, okay, so there is a one more question from Modern Way. So would you consider it a success in your country? Is Africa ready to adopt this and how would you support? Mm -hmm. I think like uh, we are, uh, so first part, like on the success, uh, well, we are still seeing, like uh, we're still growing with uh, with uh, uh, the country, like we're still mobilizing. Like, so to be a success to me, is really like when we're gonna be in a point of, uh, you know, we are achieving, like when we are leading, we do have the, the means to that and we needed to start really being ahead of the curve rather than lagging that. So this is requiring a lot of uh, discussions uh, uh, debates and uh, really bringing everyone together. That's not an easy task like to actually do, uh, especially like from different interests in multiple parties. In that sense, I think like advancing the conversation, like I would say it's a success, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And then I think like for the second piece, like on Africa ready to adopt this, like uh, I'm not sure which country specifically you're talking, like I'm not very familiar with the EV landscape like in, in Africa, but uh, Definitely there, I think, uh, based on the conversation or the, the uh, what has been presented today from multiple um, sites, like from Bangladesh, like from uh, um, uh, Canada and the US right now, like I think of, there are many, there are multiple ways like that uh, this can be addressed essentially. So um, yeah, it's really basically understanding what what is the, uh, the focus there and uh, trying to find the key partners and leads and that in each of these regions that can support this to advocate for that. Okay, thank you, uh, Gabriela. Actually, it is great to see the, you know, uh, seven gens pioneering, uh, pioneering work, and then sincere efforts is really great to see. Okay, so now we will move on to the panel discussion. Uh, so I prepared uh, one a specific question to each speaker. So I'll, yeah, actually it's not a difficult question. So first uh, I I would like to give a question to Swash. Uh, actually you like uh, really uh, highlight the importance of uh, like uh, uh, the really uh, strong efforts should be done in uh, mobility sector to for the GHG uh, emission reduction. So my question is that uh, you know, like uh, we know that global st stock taking, but uh, my question is that are there any uh, like uh, uh, strong global uh, efforts or, or uh, activity or partnerships really to tightly uh, manage the GHG the emission reduction in uh, mobility area. Any strong like uh, a partnership to control or reduce the GHG emission in mobility sector? Uh, you see, I think uh, 
I would not say there is one particular initiative. There are multiple initiatives which are ongoing because as I said in my presentation, there would be multiple actions which would be required. Some actions may be on the demand side, like better urban planning, uh, promotion of public transportation. All these things uh, are there. Uh, but at the same time, then there are some very technology specific initiatives also, like we all know about this global electric mobility EV initiative, which UNEP together with IEA and other partners is implementing. So that's a large program. And uh, what I uh, understand it's, it's also being upscaled now in the new, new Jeff cycle also. So there is funding available and new countries are also joining that uh, initiative. And it is uh, uh, essentially uh, largely focused on passenger transport, I would say in a bigger way, uh, this global EV initiative, because it is focusing on two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers. Then uh, we are also, for example, from here involved in another project, which is for example, uh, called this Solutions Plus project, which is EU funded, which is also on demonstration and piloting of uh, EVs in uh, different uh, African, Asian, and Latin American countries. And it includes some sometimes demonstration actions which are related to charging infrastructure creation and all that. So I would say, yeah, there is, uh, 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 you can say, uh, uh, some kind of uh, such projects and programs which are there. But if we are looking at large scale implementation, then we should be looking at, for example, GCF and all that. So they have uh, at least a, a priority, uh, like EVs is a priority for that. And a number of such, such, such projects have been uh, funded from GCF side. Plus they have also created, you can say, uh, uh, certain mechanisms through which you can say private sector players can also participate in that. So there are certain initiatives which uh, for which proposals or can be submitted because generally this GCF funding is not so much uh, targeted toward the private sector, but the private sector can also participate in those kind of initiatives. This is what I would say off the top of my head comes to my mind. But uh, yeah, if there is some, there are other panelists also, if they have some some other initiatives or such things in mind, they can also bring that. Okay, thank you, Subash, for the uh, wonderful answer. Okay, the second question is to goes to uh, Devon. Actually, you uh, introduced uh, two cases in Bangladesh and Rao. Actually, uh, could you elaborate more on your like future plan because such a repeating. Uh, such a uh, implementation in other countries is very also helpful. So if you have a, a future plans in other countries, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I mean, our organization actually is working on a few other projects um, <clears throat> in other countries, in Cambodia and, uh, and in Nepal as well, and a similar projects actually. So, um, you know, I think a lot in South Asia, and uh, we, we work a lot with Asian countries, so in South Asia, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of things in common, informal transport being one of the things that's really uh, common in those in those countries. So, um, you know, we, we uh, I think that's something we'd like to do uh, in the future again, which we've worked on in the Lao project, is more projects related to informal transport and how we can make that smarter, how can, we can plan that a little better. Um, but yes, we're always looking for new projects to do. So uh, happy to work with CTCN again. Uh, you know, anything related to smart technology and and public transport networks, um, I think, is great opportunity for technology transfer from Korea for sure. Yeah, thank you. And then, yeah, final question to uh, uh, Gabriela. Actually. Uh, uh, I know I understood that uh, the G7 is a youth uh, group uh, business, or that's what I understand, correct? Sorry, like I don't know if I use youth, youth group uh, business. Uh, I mean the startups. 
Okay. Uh, if if our, our the seven gen group like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 we are startup like a basic oh. kind of we're we're fast fast great fast fast based uh, growing startup but it's uh, yeah okay so my question actually the kind of question is uh, can you like uh, really uh, deliver inspiring uh, message to use that how you know like uh, through your work. Uh, on sustainable mobility and EVs, can you really like uh, deliver inspiring message to use on that? Yeah. Well, we'll try. Like I think, <laughs> I think that, that is that is our everyday work, right? Like trying to um, like a, we see lo a lot of mountains ahead of us, right? Like and when we're talking about fleet electrification, we're talking about uh, you know basically starting off the journey. But as a, one of my colleagues says, like there is always like a way to get to the beach. So you know, one it, at one point, like after we went through all of the um, the the more complex, uh, you know, details of understanding vehicles, range anxiety, chargers, like the infrastructure, how I deal with that. Uh, I think like you know, there is the moment that uh, we're we're experienced right now with a few of our customers, um, like I know that they're very very proud, that, like uh, in multiple ways, like they're more like they're happier of being. Um, testing like new products, like you know, being you know basically ahead of of uh, uh, multiple industries, they're um, very happy like of uh, of uh, the advancements. Like as I said, like about the air quality, the noise, uh, the 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 new technology they're testing. Some of them have reported to me also like how happy they are with being in, a, in the market, like and being adjusting to the new mindset. Like the solar bit of fleet managers are. Uh, basically trying to move from paperwork like to understanding like Excel spreadsheets to understanding software um, um, uh, basically features like and re being able to report on that and being able to communicate that gives them this uh, empowers them like to basically uh, understand more about like different aspects right and being of course part of the movement to uh, achieve our uh, 2030, 2035 goals, like kind of a, a decarbonization. I think that is something like really, really important. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, uh, partners. That's not something we can do alone. Like uh, so, we have a lot of partners, like from multiple uh, industry uh, industries, and also um, like that thinking in a new type of city, like smart cities, essentially, and micro micro uh, micro uh, mobility. Uh, from long haul transportation, like you no, know, all of those need to come together when we're basically designing like a new city. So that is very, for me, very exciting, like to be part of this essentially. And uh, I would welcome other people as well to think through how uh, effectively you can think like in your communities. How can you start like today, like leveraging this communication and everything? So I think that's 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 the last message I have. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, the today is. Well, several keywords would be like partnerships and collaboration and then integration or holistic approaches. Okay, I think it is time to close uh, the uh, webinar. Actually, we really uh, cannot uh, have such a wonderful webinar uh, without uh, eminent speakers and dedicated and uh, committed speakers. Uh, Subhash, uh, Devon, and Gabriela, thank you so much. And then also we, I do not forget to mention Jaewon and Anastasia Dae, our CTCN team. We, without their help and then support, we cannot make it. And then also uh, Valentin and Ramiro or uh, Jar from NREL, they always recommended very good uh, speakers. So yeah, we don't know. Actually, we will record this one and then share with the uh, NDs and then our citizen network members. And then we don't know yet future plan in next year. But uh, yeah, yeah, we'll try to develop more other <laughs> improved webinars in next year. But yeah, then the final uh, mention will be like uh, because we will meet in next year. So I can say uh, Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs>
And yeah, actually, Gabriela is early morning and Devon is uh, really bit almost midnight. Thank you for your uh, great contribution again. OK, thank you, everyone. And thank you all the uh, participants for your strong support. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Gracias. Come sum it up.